Well, today we're beginning a new message series called Change Your World. Now, if you look around your world, is there anything you'd like to see changed? Is this a perfect world that we're living in? No, there's a lot of things that we would like to see changed. When God looks around, he sees things that he wants to change. If you remember, we've been studying the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And why do we pray that? Because God's will is not being done on earth as it is in heaven. And so God wants to change things in our world as well. And so we talked about prayer, the importance of prayer in our last series, Praying with Jesus. In this series, Change Your World, we're going to be talking about actions that you and I can take coupled with prayer, which will bring about change in our world. Now, why did God create us? Why did, he got, why did God create me? Why did he create you? He created us to make a difference in our world. He created us to influence our world for him. He created us to have a relationship with him and through that relationship to influence people around us for his kingdom. And so when we talk about changing our world, we're, we're not really talking about changing things so much as, as changing people. The only thing in this world that's going to last forever, it's not this building, it's not the highways, it's not the electric grid, it's not the, even the internet. The only thing that's going to last forever in this world is people. And so people are by far the most important thing in this world. People made in the very image of God. They're going to last forever. People are going to spend eternity in one of two destinations, either in heaven or in hell. And God wants us to influence people, both for their lives in this world, here and now, and for eternity. And we influence others by letting our lights shine. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, and you can follow along in the white page in the middle of your bulletin. I'd encourage you to pull that out. It's got the outline written out with the verses. On the back side is a study guide uh, that we go over in our small groups. And uh, for those who are in the Sunday night small group, we're off this week. And so that's noted in your bulletin. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And so if you're a believer here this morning, you have the light of Jesus in your life. Jesus is the light of the world and as believers in him, we are Little lights as we let his light shine through us. And we need to let our light shine. It's possible to hide your light so that nobody can see it. But we need to let our light shine so others can see it. And that's what our picture that you can see for this message series is all about. Do you see the guy removing the basket from the light to let it shine? That represents your life. That represents my life. We are to let it shine. We're not to let it be covered up. Uncover your light so everybody can see and be influenced by it. I'd like us to watch a video clip about being the light of the world. It's called Your Light. So what does light do? Light dispels the darkness. You're in a dark room and you turn on the lights and the darkness flees. And when lights join together, as we saw in that video, the impact can be even greater than each light shining by itself. And so, so that's one of the reasons that God has us joined together in a church family so that the, the, there's a synergy of our lights as they shine together for the Lord. Now, is it easy to let your light shine before men? A few people say no. Most people don't know what, this, what the answer is. The answer is no. It's not easy, is it? Because everybody doesn't like to see our lights. You ever met somebody that didn't like to see your light shine? I didn't want you to tell them about Jesus or the truth or God's word. Who wanted to live life 
apart from God. It takes courage to let your light shine. Many people do not have God's light within them. And the Bible tells us that people who are unbelievers actually love the darkness. And if you love the darkness, you don't want a light shining into your dark places because it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel guilty. It might be bringing some of the conviction of the Holy Spirit into your life. And so many do not want to see the light. In fact, they tell us, cover up your light. Your religion is a private matter, so don't bother me with it. And they try to get us to put the basket over our heads. But we need to let our light shine. Why should we let our light shine? Why should we reach out to those who don't know Jesus? That's what we're going to be talking about in this series. Why, why reach out? Why let those lights shine? Today we're going to look at Jesus' answer to that question. We're going to discover... Jesus' heart for the lost. What he felt towards people who were living in darkness. For those that didn't yet know him. Our story begins in Luke chapter 15. Verse 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around him to hear. Were gathered around to hear him, speaking of Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What was going on here? Jesus was... Letting his light shine. He's the light of the world. He was letting his light shine in the darkness. He had some sinners and some well, tax collectors, which were not everybody's best buddy. You know? <laughs> kind of like today, right? I hope there's nobody here that works for the IRS. But anyhow, it's a fine job. It's a fine job if you do. God has a purpose for tax collectors. But they were not well received back then. The tax collectors took bribes and all kinds of things. And they collected way more than they were supposed to. And so they were kind of the lowest of the low. But Jesus loved them. He loved sinners. He loved tax collectors. And he was talking to them. And he was being criticized for letting his light shine. How dare you talk to these kind of people, Jesus? Cover up that light. We don't want you to let it shine. And in response to the, these comments and this attitude of the Pharisees, Jesus tells three stories to explain why we should reach out, why we should let our light shine. The first story was about a shepherd. A shepherd had a hundred sheep and he lost one sheep. And he went looking and searching until he found that sheep, that lost, uh, that lost animal. The second story Jesus told was about a woman who had ten coins. And she lost one of the ten coins. They were very valuable coins. And she searched. She searched every corner of her house until she found the coin. In both of these stories, the lost, the lost sheep and the lost coin, Jesus ends by saying that there is rejoicing in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. There's rejoicing in heaven over every lost sinner that repents. There's a party in heaven. There's a celebration in heaven. It's a big deal. When a sinner repents. And he was saying. Just as a sheep is lost. The shepherd goes looking for the sheep. Just as a coin is lost. And a woman goes looking for her coin. People are valuable. Valuable to God. Valuable to us. And we ought to search. And seek. And reach out for them. Jesus said in Luke 19.10. For the son of man. Speaking of himself. Came to seek. And to save what was lost. That's the reason Jesus came to this earth. To seek and to save lost people. Now I know it's not politically correct to call unbelievers lost anymore. But it's what the Bible uses. And I just really can't get around it. They are lost. And they need to be found. And we ought to do the same as Jesus. And so in Jesus' third story about seeking the lost, the lost the thing that is lost is not a sheep, it's not a coin, but it's a son. And so, which would be the most valuable? Which would you search the hardest for? A sheep, a coin, or a son? A son. And so the magnitude of the loss is even greater here. So why reach out? Well, we need to understand that sin has terrible effects in people's lives. So Jesus begins his story in verse 11. He says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. 
And so he divided his property between them. And so the father in the story had two sons. Normally the eldest son would get two-thirds of the inheritance in, in a Jewish society and the younger son would get a third. And also an inheritance was normally distributed just as today when the father passed on. Right? That's when inheritance is given. And so the request, for this, the request by this younger son to have his inheritance while the father was still living was highly unusual. It was pretty rude and very self-centered. And I think it illustrates right from the get-go the uh, sinful heart, the self-centered heart, the self-seeking heart of this younger son. He really disregarded his father. He wasn't honoring his father. He was only concerned about himself. And one of the terrible effects of sin is that sin separates people from God and others. It's not long after that, after the son had received his share of the inheritance of the estate, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country. And so the younger son, he wasn't kicked out of home. He chose voluntarily to leave home, to leave his father, to leave his family, and go to a far removed, a distant country. And why did he leave? Well, first of all, obviously, he didn't appreciate his father. He didn't appreciate his family. He didn't appreciate what he had. He was looking for something else. And secondly, as we'll see in a minute, the the son had in mind a lifestyle that he knew his father would not appreciate at all. And so he wanted to go as far away from any oversight, uh, from any speaking of his father into his life as possible. And so in this story, the father represents in many ways God. And so sin separates people from God. Sin separates people from their heavenly father. People want to, to hide in the darkness, far away from the light of their heavenly Father, far away from the family of God. Sin squanders a person's God-given potential. It says, as this son set off for a distant country, and there, in that distant country, he squandered his wealth in wild living. And you can just let your imagination run wild, and it's that's probably pretty accurate. Later in the story, the elder brother says that the son wasted his wealth on prostitutes. He just did whatever he wanted to do. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And so this lifestyle of the son, it was self-centered, it was, uh, was pleasure-seeking, it was wild living. And all the inheritance that the father had given him, saved up over a lifetime, was rapidly spent. And it was gone in a short time. We don't know if it was a few months or a year or two, but it didn't take long. And all the money that he had was gone. And what happens when all your money is gone and you're living that type of lifestyle? All your friends go away. They're just around you when the good times are rolling, when you have all the money, when you have the parties and everything else, but the money was gone. And so all his friends left. He had to stoop to the menial task of feeding pigs. It seemed the pigs got more to eat than him. It was a messy job. It was an ugly job. It was a muddy job. And we don't really appreciate it because he was a Jewish boy. And what are pigs? They're unclean animals. And so it was the lowest of the low jobs for, a, for an Israelite. It was particularly repulsive. Now this was not what his father had in mind for his son be living in a pig pen, feeding the pigs. It was not how the son should have used his inheritance. So everything that the father had planned for him had been squandered. Sin in the son's life had, had wasted his God-given potential, what God had created him to do. Now let's think again about our question, why reach out? Why reach out? 
How does this story speak to this question? Why reach out to the lost? We reach out to the lost because their lives are being devastated by sin. If somebody doesn't know Jesus, their lives are being devastated by sin. Whether we can see it or not, it is happening. And at first, it might not be apparent. I'm sure that in the first few months, the son had lots of money. Uh, he had his own fast donkey probably or something. I don't know <laughs> what they had. But he had something that attracted people. He had fine clothes. Everything was wonderful. He seemed to be having the time of his life. Oh, it was great being away from dad and all those rules and regulations. It was great just being able to do whenever, whatever he wanted whenever he wanted. It was great to be able to stay up late at night and sleep in half the day, eat whatever he wanted, drink as much as he wanted, have whoever he wanted. He had lots of friends, so-called friends. You know, when you have a lot of money, a lot of people kind of gather around you. It's the same today. And everything seemed to be going good. Wow, look at that guy. I wish I was like him. Wow, that inheritance he has and doesn't have a care in the world, but underneath. His life was wasting away. And so anybody who's not living for Jesus, they're lost. They're separated from God. They're separated from God's family. They're wasting their lives. They're wasting their resources on things that really don't matter. They're wasting them on things that are ultimately going to destroy them. And rather than being angry with lost people, God wants us to have a heart of compassion, to understand, to see through, to see through the the mirage, to see through the facade that deep down they need Jesus. Deep down they're trying to fill an emptiness in their life that only Jesus can fill. And so as believers, you and I, if you're a believer here this morning, you have an answer for every lost person. You have an answer. And most of these people, most of the people around us, they don't know they're lost. They don't get up in the morning and say, I'm lost. They don't even know it. This son didn't realize that he was lost and estranged from his father. He was enjoying life until things started to go downhill. And so Jesus is the only hope for the lost. Because of the pride of people, many times it's exactly how Things happened in this story. Until a person reaches rock bottom in their life, until they realize that things are totally messed up, they're not going to reach out to God for help. They might try all kinds of things. They might try other religions. They might try therapy. They might try all kinds of things. Drugs, alcohol. And yet nothing is going to save them from their lostness. Jesus is the only hope for the lost. In order to find him, in order to find Jesus, the lost have to come to their senses. Verse 17, and Jesus continues with the story. He says, when he, speaking of the younger son, in the pig pen, in the mud, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. You see, the lifestyle of a lost person makes no sense at all in God's eyes. In eternity's eyes, it makes no sense. It's foolish. It's, it's destructive. It's something, a lifestyle, a sinful lifestyle destroys a person's life and it, it hurts and destroys other people, but they don't recognize what they're doing. It doesn't make sense. But prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's life can help them come to their senses and to begin to, and begin to think clearly once again. In Jesus' story, the, the son finally began to realize the truth. It began to dawn on him. God was working in his heart. He began to realize that life away from dad wasn't so great after all. In fact, it was, it was terrible. Doing whatever he wanted, whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted, wasn't so great. He was now starving to death. 
And he realized, even though he was the son of his father, who was obviously a man of some substance, had built up the family business, he realized now that he was worse off than the hired man that his father had working on the farm. He realized that he needed to ask for forgiveness. He said in verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. And so the son realized that he had sinned not only against his father, but he'd sinned against heaven, he'd sinned against God. He'd done what was wrong and he was now reaping the fruit of those wrong actions. And he determined in his heart, I'm going to go back. I'm going to return to my father's house and I'm going to ask him for forgiveness. I'm going to say, I'm sorry. I'm going to say, I've sinned. Please forgive me. Will you take me back? He realized he had not been acting as the son, as a son should have. He was content just to have the status of a hired hand in his father's house. And so I think we can see that this pride, this arrogance that had been in the son's heart was now being replaced with a humility, was now being replaced with a repentant spirit. Returning to his father's house, he realized was his only hope. But why reach out? Because Jesus is the only hope for a lost person. They are like that lost son. We look at the whole of the Bible, we see that Jesus is the only way that a person can be forgiven of their sins. It's the only way, he is the only way for a lost person to be restored to their relationship with their Heavenly Father. Jesus is not one of many hopes, he's not one of many ways to be saved, he's the only way. As we said before, many or I would say most lost people, they don't realize they're lost. They don't realize what they're missing in life. The son didn't realize when he left home with his inheritance that he was lost, but he was. And so we reach out to lost people. We don't go up to them and say, you're lost, Buster, you know. But in a way, we help them come to their senses to see life in God's light. To see life, the truth of life, and what is happening in their lives apart from God. And as we reach out to them, as we pray for them, when they come to their senses, they are going to ask for Jesus' forgiveness. They're going to repent. They're going to turn away from their sin and put their faith in God. If a lost person doesn't find Jesus' forgiveness in this life, they're going to spend eternity separated from God. They're separated from God in this life if they don't have a relationship with Him and they'll be separated forever in a place called hell. Those that are believers will be together with God in a place called heaven. And so why reach out? Because we want the lost to find Jesus. We want them to, to know Him in this life and we want them to live forever with Him in the next. And so God wants us to have His heart of love for the lost. As we come to the conclusion of the story this morning, we're going to see that God's love for the lost is demonstrated in the love of this father for his son. The younger son had dishonored his father. He'd taken his inheritance early. He left home. He made a mess of his life. And yet we see that the father's heart had nothing for his son except love. He was ready to welcome him back. And so the son got up from his pig pen. He got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I wonder what the father was doing in the months, perhaps a year or two after the son had left. I'm sure he didn't forget his son. I'm sure he was thinking about him. I'm sure he was praying for him. 
Maybe he went out every day and looked down the road and thought, someday he's going to come back. And one day, as he went out and looked down the road, he saw a speck in the distance. And he, could this be my son? My speck got a little closer. He thought, it kind of looks like him. It kind of walks like him. Maybe it is him. And he began to run. And he ran until he reached his son. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. He had compassion for his son. He didn't wait for his son to arrive. He was ready to welcome him back in an instant. And that father serves as an example of the heart we should have for lost people who come to God, who come with repentant hearts. And when they come, it's occasion for celebration, to celebrate with heaven when they're found. Says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. And so the father wasn't about to receive his son back as a hired hand. He was only going to receive him back as his son. And so he made arrangements for the best robe. It was probably the father's robe. Who would have the best robe but the father? He gave him his, his own robe. Ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. And a wonderful feast of celebration. This son had been for all practical purposes dead and gone and buried. He had no communication with him for all the time he was gone. And now, he was as it were brought to life again. He'd been lost and now he was found. And so the father in all of heaven celebrated that the son was found. And so why reach out to the lost? Because we love them. And we look forward to welcoming them back into God's family. We want to celebrate with heaven over every sinner who repents. It's a wonderful thing. It's really one of the biggest things, or if not the biggest thing in life. Because it impacts eternity. You know, most of the things we get excited about aren't going to have much meaning in eternity, are they? You know, whether the Blues win or the Cardinals win, it's fun to get excited, but in the overall scheme of things, things, it really doesn't mean a whole lot. But when a sinner repents, it makes a difference for eternity. Now notice that Jesus makes the point in each of his three stories. First story about the lost sheep, second about the lost coin, and hear about the lost son. That the lost are found when they come to God and they repent. Repentance is very important. For a sinner to repent, it means they turn away from their sins. They don't keep on. The son left his lifestyle. He left it behind. And he came to live in his father's house. He turned away from his sinful lifestyle. And he put his faith and trust once again in his Father. And so that's the good news that Jesus came to bring to us. That we can be saved. We can be found as we turn away from our sin and put our faith in Jesus Christ. The spiritually dead can be made alive. Why reach the lost? Because that transformation of a lost person to a found person is the greatest miracle. You see, heaven doesn't just celebrate for anything. But heaven celebrates. The angels get excited. It's a big deal. Because that lost person who repents is going to be with them forever. And so they're excited about it. Forever and ever. God wants us to have his heart of love for the lost. So why reach out? Because sin has a devastating effect on people's lives here and now and in eternity. And the only hope for the lost 
And we were all lost at one point is Jesus Christ. When a lost person repents, God, heart of love, receives them as his children. Why reach out? Because if you're a believer here, that's one of the main reasons you're still here on this earth. To touch other people's lives. We're going to worship God in heaven. It's good to worship Him here. We're going to worship Him forever. We're going to fellowship with other believers in heaven. We're going to learn more about God in heaven. The Bible teaches. But what's the one thing we're not going to do in heaven? We're not going to have an opportunity to reach out to any lost people anymore. That time is going to be past. And so now is the day. Now is the time to let our lights shine. If you're a believer, you have the light of Jesus in you. And that light will dispel the darkness. That light will attract people to Jesus if it's allowed to shine. If it's not covered up. And so this morning, is your light shining? Is it just peeking out a little bit under that basket? Or is the basket completely off? And it's shining brightly. And everybody that sees you knows this person is different. This person has the light of Jesus in their life. This person is somebody I'd like to get to know. Love the lost. Help them come to their senses. Lead them to Jesus. Let your light shine. And we can change our world one person at a time. To be the light in this dark world, we have to have the light of Jesus inside of us. And to do that, we admit that we've sinned. We repent. We can't help somebody else repent until we've repented. We repent. We turn away from our sin. We believe Jesus died to forgive us and we commit our lives to following him. So let's bow our heads right now. We're going to pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. And today we admit that we've sinned. We've lived in the darkness. But we believe that Jesus came and died that we might be forgiven. Please forgive us for the dark things that we've done. Come into our lives. We commit our lives to following you. We recommit our lives to following you. All the days of our life. The walking in the light with you. And Father, for those who are believers here this morning, we thank you for this story of Jesus, a story that demonstrates how we should devote our lives to seeking the lost as you did. God, may each of us have an awareness that there are terrible effects of sin in the lives of those who do not yet know you. May we do everything within our power to demonstrate that you, Jesus, are the only hope for each lost person that we know. Give us a heart of love, a heart of compassion. Give us an urgency. Give us a, a priority to reach the lost. May we, may we take the basket off our heads. May we have the courage to let our light shine even though some may try to blow our lights out. Some may tell us to go back in the closet. God, help us to let our light shine brightly in the darkness. And we pray, God, that as each of us lets our light shine more brightly this year, that you draw people to Jesus. Through each of our lives individually in our church family here at Life Church. In Jesus' name, the light of the world, we pray. Amen.